hunting, fishing, and everything that was my dad, like most Indiana or Kentucky boys do. But, you know, I, I wasn't big on it. I didn't care much about it. So I kind of put that to the wayside, you know, I just went about my business. Well, I ended up moving. I hit a point in my life where everything I was doing in ministry was going great, but there was no more money, you know, because I, I wouldn't take people's money, you know, unless I knew that I was working for it, right? I'm not one of the ministers that they need money, right? Wasn't about that for me. And I knew that as long as I did what I was supposed to be doing, God would provide in some miraculous way. Well, over a period of years, I thought, hey, we're doing the right thing, but now all the money's drying up. And we started losing everything we had. Uh, we lost our house. We lost our cars. We lost it all. And in the midst of that, it made me press harder and harder into God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What am I doing wrong? And um, the day I lost my car, I got a phone call from somebody that said, hey, go pick out the car you want. So the day I lost my car, we ended up getting the car back. Bigger and better than the one we had. You know, it was used, but it was, it was great. It lasted us for many years. Um, I was losing my house. And at that time, I'm like, what am I going to do? The Lord said, do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. Do what I tell you. So he kept telling me, prepare, learn, press in. So that's what I started doing. Many months went by, and I didn't hear from the bank. Many more months go by, still didn't hear from the bank. So after 11 months, I thought I should call them. And um, then came around and I said, hey, uh, you know, we're still here. What do you want me to do? They said, well, you just stay there. Thanks, Mr. Hunt, for staying there. And we'll get in contact with you and let you know what to do. So a couple more months go by. We got a date in the mail. So move out by this date. And we're like, okay, we're, we're, we've been ready to leave. We were scared to death, you know. Never happened to us before. Didn't know what to expect. Well, it all come to pass and like, now what are we going to do? We're thinking, well, God's got some awesome plan because, you know, he did the car thing, everything's moving, and nothing was there. The only place that we could go was my parents' house. Oh. I had three kids, you know. I had three kids, and we had to move into one room, and I did not get along with my parents. You know, I did not be, you know, they smoked, and, you know, my dad was a drinker, and Ugh, couldn't handle it. Well, that's where we went. They were the only ones willing to take us in. So I was like, well, after, you know, Robin and I arguing about it, talking about it, not wanting to do it, crying about it, we were like, well, we got to do it. Got rid of everything we had. We didn't save stuff in a, in a locker or anything like that. We just got rid of it. We said, we're doing it. So for 90 days, we ended up living with my parents, which turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because I got really good at preaching. Because for 90 days and 90 nights, I went down there with my dad. He'd come home from work, and he worked construction at that time. And he was you know, a pretty heavy drinker and chain smoker, both my parents were. So as soon as he got home, he had his case of beer, and he was drinking till he went to bed. So I'd go down there, take my Bible, I'd slam it on the table, and I'd tear him apart every night. And then about three nights a week, all his buddies would come over and join in his festivities. Well, first time I let it go by, and I avoided it because I didn't want to do it. I'm not going drunk. But then I was like, heard the Lord's voice. Yeah, I'm doing what I told you to do. <laughs> okay. So I go downstairs, I get right in the middle of it. So I kept on trucking every night. And finally, his buddies were coming over just to hear me. And they started putting their drinks out and they wasn't drinking. And then they started listening and wanted to know more. And we talked about it. And I ended up the worst one of the bunch. He gave his heart to the Lord. And I baptized him in my dad's bathtub that night. And that guy's never been the same since. He's not a heavy drinker. He's, he's, he's doing pretty darn well. And um, he's not where we want him to be, but you know how that goes. You know, but seed were sown and everything went. And after that, it changed my dad. And from that point on, I started seeing a drastic difference in things in my dad's life, in my mom's life, and even in my life, because 
I was able to let go of that unforgiveness and bitterness and things like that I had towards them. And when that happened, everything changed. And so a little while later, we got asked to move to the place we live now out on the farm out in Bethlehem, Kentucky. And that was my grandfather's farm. And he, he, um, he had somebody living there and they ended up leaving. And at this time, I didn't have a relationship with my grandfather. He, he didn't even know we were in a house. He didn't know anything about it. We'd seen, you know, Christmas and Easter. He was one of those kind of people. Now, I didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter by that time, so guess what? I didn't see him. <laughs> you know, um, I think we'd stop by on Father's Day. So, it was rough, rough going. When he asked us, he said, I got a farm, and I've been there one time. Would you be interested in coming out there? I know you got your house, but, you know, maybe you could work it out to where you all could move out there. I was like, Grandpa, we've been living with Mom and Dad for a few months. What do you mean? You know, and that's his thing. What do you mean? You know, he that. But uh, going off about that, and he said, Well, come out there and look. And when I go out there, I was like, Well, maybe this is where the Lord wants us. Boy, I didn't think it was once we got there. I mean, it was, it was bad. We had to rip the walls off, the carpets out. There was dog duty, that deep in half the rooms. And we were like, This can't be right. <laughs> we're just wondering. So we look and we're like, well, we got this opportunity. We can go back to what we've been doing. And I was like, well, guess what? We're going to suck it up and get to work. So we spent the next month getting that house. And we had no money coming in. We don't know how we even got there. I can't tell you how things came in. All I can tell you is that when we put our hand to work in that house, the materials started coming together to get it all finished. So we were able to get that house completely gutted, redone, and everything came together. And then for the next six months, I didn't know what to do because I was, I was still focused on the old things. Right? I wasn't focusing on where God was taking me and wanting me to go. So we cried you know, for six months whining. We were used to going to the store day to day if we needed groceries to this five minutes away. Well, now it's 35 minutes away. So there was a drastic change in our lifestyle instantly. Um, it was just a big, a big change. So after six months of whining, of not knowing what to do, the Lord finally told us. He said, you're not doing what I called you to do. What did I do? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. And um, again, I had the dream. Um, and then not only me, but a friend of mine had that same vision. He said, man, I've seen you out in the field. Most people can't. I'm like, okay. Then a guy in Arkansas I'd never met before called me. And he says, your name Jason Hunt? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, the Lord told me to look up a guy named Jason Hunt in Kentucky, and I have a word for you. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, he's one of those. Had a lot of those called over the years. But nothing like that. He, he told me everything that had happened leading all the way up to what's going on and where we're going next. And I was like, well, maybe this guy's got something. So, um, I started looking at where I was. What do I have right here, right now, that can enable me to equip God's people for the days that I had? Well, I looked around. I didn't have nothing but a lot of land. We have 125 acres. And I was like, you know what? I need to learn how to utilize this land to equip God's people so that one day I'll see all these tents, you know, lying in these fields. So I joined the fire department. I joined search and rescue teams. I pretty much joined anything I could join, trying to get all the training. One day as I'm watching TV one night, this guy on television, and he was on a survival show. And the Lord kind of interrupted my show, you know, sitting there watching, and the Lord said, you need to call that man, because he needs to hear from me. And I was like, I earned enough to tell my wife, and she, you're a man. So, what? I don't know you. I said, well, now I'm definitely going to call. So, anyway, I called the guy, and uh, he told me that, you know, I worked out and called and talked and invited me out to this place and I ended up going out there. And sure enough, when I got out there to meet him, it happened to be during the week of festivities he had in the summertime. 
And every one of those tents that I'd seen in that vision were all there. And it was a survival training program. with the whole seminar, series related to survival preparedness and everything in between. And he said, you're the one that we've been missing. He said, you need to start ministering here. He said, because everybody needs it. And sure enough, um, I started going tent to tent, doing the thing, you know, instead of knocking on doors preaching, you know, I was going tent preaching. And um, it was like a revival out there in the middle of the woods. And uh, we had people coming to Jesus to know to know God, His commandments, His festivals, because I teach all the survival and preparedness in, you know, in a way so that through the festivals you understand. Because once you understand the biblical festivals, you understand survival and preparedness that much more. And in those festivals, God wants you to know how to survive. He wants you to know how to prepare. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and Sukkot, I call it the Festival of Shelters, you know, just to keep things a little simpler for people who don't understand. You're going out, you're building a debris hut, and you're going to live in that hut for a week. And he wanted, he said, during that time, he's coming to meet with you. And he promises to meet with you. And I, ever since I've been doing that, I didn't realize that I was doing survival things, but I didn't understand in that context. Well, uh, we ended up baptizing people in the lake out of that meeting, and um, we're bringing more souls in, and ever since then it's just been going up and things have been going awesome. So that's really how I got into survival preparedness and what led me to start what we do out at our farm called Kentucky River Bushcraft. Bushcraft is just another word for survival preparedness, more or less. And um, that's what we do. We now take people out into our farm. We let them camp and we teach them survival skills um, and everything in between. And we put it in a biblically based context so that they understand that they're not there just to learn how to camp or hunt or fish. They're learning a skill that will not only help themselves in years to come, but also ministry tools that will enable them to help others in the years to come. Because that's really what it's about for me. If you just want to learn how to survive for the sake of surviving, you might as well give it up. Because we know Jesus said that those that seek to save their own life are those that surely are going to lose it. And you got all these preppers out here that like to get all their guns and ammo stocked up, and that's their thing. You know, when somebody comes and gets me, I'm going to shoot them from a mile away. Those that live by the sword are going to die by the sword. That's not the way to go either. So we can't depend on that. What's the purpose? Is there a godly purpose in that? And these are Christian preppers saying this kind of stuff. There's no purpose in that. There has to be an eternal purpose in everything we do for survival and preparedness. And what it is, is showing others the way. Saying, hey, God wants you to do it. Here's proof in the festivals. If you know the festivals, you should already have some indication that there is evidence of doing it. Passover, what do you do? You get dressed, put all your clothes on, you said, make your meal, and then act like you're getting ready to get the road. As soon as it's done, right? Why did he tell you that? You might have to bug out one day during dinner. Think of it that way. Put it in that context. You could be eating dinner one day and all of a sudden the wrong people knock at your door and you got to run. And when you run, God's going to be there and protect you because this is His plan. He's going to be with you as you go. But you better have a plan. you got to have a plan. He's not going to give it all to you and say, hey, you go with the clothes on your back and everything's going to fall from the sky. There's no promise of that this time. There was last time. We may not be that way this time. We don't know. So we need to have that plan in place. Which brings us to our little survival kit. And we'll get into this in a bit. But something as small as this little big kit that everybody can get. This thing's cheap. Everybody can get a little kit like this and throw it in their car, their trunk, and forget about it. And then if you had, if you got caught in that situation, you can endure, you know, three or four days, no problem. So if you would, turn your Bible to 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath. We're going to talk about something called the five, what I call the five smooth stones of survivability. 
Now there's another version of this message that I've ministered on before. And it relates to Ephesians 4.11. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The fivefold ministry a lot of people call that, right? So the five smooth stones relate to that, I believe, definitely. But it also relates us to survivability. And we're going to find out why. We know in 1 Samuel 17, we learned the story of David's life. We know that Goliath's been out there and he's been taunting that Israelite army 40 days a night. And they're getting pretty bummed out at this point. Nobody's going to go out and fight. And then Jesse sent David in to take some bread, go get the latest news report. What's going on today? You know, what kind of trash is that army is talking today? So that's what he did. He goes down there. And then David hears what Goliath, the taunt. And what was the taunt? He said, if you send out your best guy and beat us, he said, we'll be your slaves forever. But if we beat you, you have to agree to be our slaves forever. Well, they hear that, and everybody backs away, except when one guy David. David hears that, and he's like, oh, that's a good deal. Because he had faith and experience that said that he could overcome that adversity. One, he had experience, and where to get it? As a shepherd, right? He was out in the fields, and it says that he beat lions and bears with nothing more than a sling, a club, or his bare hands. That's a guy you like to have on your side. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, that's a saying a lot. <laughs> Taking on bears, lions, and with nothing but your bare hands and a club. That's a tough guy. So, he had experience previous in a survival situation to say, well, this survival situation isn't that bad. I, I bought bears and lions bigger and better than this giant. He's not. So, he had the experience. And then, he had the faith because he knew he obeyed God's commandments. And he had the testimony that God had handed down. He knew he followed the teachings of his forefathers. So, he knew he was in the right. So, what are you all afraid of? God said, we can do this. So, what's everybody weeding out for? Let's go. They all laugh at him. So, he goes, we know the rest of the story. He talks to the king. And they get, he gets the armor on. He puts it on. Doesn't like it. It's not because it's too big. It's because it didn't fit. He didn't like the way it fit. He's a shepherd. He's used to fighting fast. Right? Fighting these lions and tigers. You can't do that with big chunks of armor and a big giant sword. He wasn't used to that. And that's why he didn't want that armor. So he puts that aside and says, I'll just go out with what I got, what I'm used to. Again, he had a kit that he knew. And he had experience with that kit that enabled him to endure previous survival situations. So, he goes down across the field and as he's going, it says he stops at a creek or a brook and he picks up five smooth stones. Anybody ever wonder why five? Because it tells us five. Well, a lot of us think, well, he needed something to throw. Yeah, but he chose five stones. <coughs> As I said, that can relate to, to the stones that Jesus left the church for the equipping of the saints. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Five people, five gifts God gave to the church for equipping people, right? To make new spiritual weapons. But we're talking physical stuff right now. Okay? We're breaking it down into physical things. So he takes these five stones, he makes sure they're smooth, because if they're rough or jagged, they're not going to fly right. Because if it was flat or jagged or anything like that, it's not as aerodynamic and you can't get a good bead on your target. So, he goes down, pulls out a stone in a sling, and he flicks one stone, beans the giant in the forehead, sank in, the giant fell. Took one stone to overcome the survival situation. Because it was a survival situation yet again. One stone. Then he takes the giant sword, decapitates him, cuts the head, giant's head off. Then he took the giant's armor, the giant's sword, and the giant's head all back to camp with him. And they kept it. And they carried it around all over the place. And when they got back to Jerusalem, where did they put it? Anybody have any idea? 
there's this neat place called the Mount of the Skull, called Golgotha. Everybody heard of Golgotha? What happened on Golgotha? That's where Jesus was crucified, right? So once again, we have a survival situation. All this time later, Jesus came at an opportune time in history because mankind is yet in another survival situation. And so symbolically, Jesus comes and they crucify Him on a cross. And He sheds His blood on the same giant's head as an indication that, hey, my people who believe in Me will not be a slave to the enemy. Period. And He did it with His own blood on Golgotha. Goliath was from Gath. Golgath. Pop. So, mouth of the skull. That's where they buried Goliath's head is in the mouth of the skull. So, in the biggest survival situation in history, Jesus gave His life for us. Shed His blood on the same hill, on the same skull, to once again prove that point. Saying they're not going to be slaves. That leads us into our survival portion. You have five smooth stones or five things you have to know um, when it comes to a survival situation. And I call these base five. If you're writing it down, you can write base, survival base five. And they're really the most important areas. First one is fire. you got to know how to make a fire. Um, you think of that as one of the stones that David picked up, one of these five smooth stones that David picked up out of the grave. These are five weapons that are going to aid you in the times ahead. One is fire making. You've got to know how to make a fire, and you've got to have the right tools to do it. Now, there are certain tools like I carry here. I've got my little knife with me. Okay, this is just a standard knife. Nothing special, really. It's just a fixed blade knife. It's not too long, not too short. Okay? It's good and thick, and it's carbon steel. You want something carbon steel over something stainless steel only because it's a little easier to sharpen and maintain. Stainless steel doesn't get all dirty looking, and it looks cleaner, better for food use, things like that. And that's fine, but they're harder to sharpen if you let it if you build it. The trick to making, keeping the knife sharp is sharpening it one time as sharp as you can get it, and then you get a piece of leather and you hone it or strop it the rest of the time. Then you never have to sharpen your knife again. I've had this knife for a while, I never sharpen it once. I just rub it up and down on some leather, just like the old barber used to do with the razors. You do the same thing, you never sharpen your knife. So you got your knife, but then you have this thing. It goes with it. A lot of people call this a metal match. Okay, this is called ferrocerium. Barrel steering. And basically what it does, it's just a soft metal that when it's struck against another metallic surface, it'll throw sparks. Okay? <laughs> so, you want these two things. If you have these two things, you can make a fire. Okay? Now there's a third thing, the component, that you want to add to these things. And that's called sure product. And the way we teach it, you want to be able to make a fire and get it sustainable within five minutes. Now what sustainable fire means is you go, you run the gamut of tinder, kindling, and fuel. Okay? Tinder, think of pencil lead. Something like the size of a pencil lead is a good tinder. And you want to tear it up and make as much surface area or fluff ball as you can. If you find a bird's nest in a tree, that is perfect tinder. You just rough it up a little bit and you've got a great tinder box. The next is kindling, and that is pencil size. So you want a lot of it. You want like that much of it. Okay, where you taste both hands you get. That's your tinder. And then you have fuel, which is thumb size or bigger. Okay? Once you can burn something thumb size or bigger, you got your fire. You don't need to worry about it anymore. But you have to make certain that you can make that fire quickly because what if your life's depending on it? A day like today, if we're outside, our car broke down on the side of the road, we're out, if you're out where I live, you're not getting any help unless somebody happens by 
and who knows how long that would be. I live pretty far out. Uh, if you take one of the back roads, you're in trouble because nobody's going to find you, especially right now because you couldn't get through them. So if you happen down one of these roads, you get stuck, you're out of gas, too far to walk, or just too cold, you're dressed like I am, not really prepared to walk a long distance in this way. A fire would be nice. So you want something, like I said, sure fire. And that can be something as simple as a cotton ball dipped in Vaseline. That sounds pretty easy, right? A cotton ball dipped in Vaseline. That is the cheapest way to make sure fire. Now you can melt that Vaseline in a pot and dip the cotton ball and set it on a plate and let it dry. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Okay? They also have other cool little gadgets and gizmos that you can get that cost more called wet fire and micro inferno, mini inferno, and they have a flammable substance impregnated into a, typically a wax disc or some type of waxy, you know, those flat makeup pads. It's usually what it is. They'll have some kind of flammable substance in that and they dip it in wax, and that's what it is. You can make that at home too. So you use that, and that gives you sure fire. That means you're surely going to get fire when you get that thing with that metal match. But you want the metal match because if it's wet or too cold, a big cigarette lighter isn't going to work or it will fail you. So you want to have several options, okay? And that's where we get into our kit. We call it the 10 piece kit. One, first thing you want is a cutting tool. That's your knife. So you're always going to keep your knife on you, okay? then you're always going to have an extra knife in your kit. Because what happens is one day you need it, is the one day you forget your knife. That's just the way it is. So you keep a good knife in your kit. This is a waterproof backup. This keeps it waterproof. You don't got to worry about it. If your car went in the river, pray that that never happens. But if your car was in the river or it flooded, you know, and you had to drag it out or something like that, you don't got to worry about it. So you keep that in here, you keep your surefire in here. Then you keep your metal match on it. Because if you don't have surefire, if you're around trees, you can peel bark off trees, or if you can find some duct tape, gorilla tape, not duct tape, gorilla tape. If you got gorilla tape, you still have surefire. Because if you light that stuff, it burns really well. And if you tear it up into little strips, use your knife to cut it up good, make a bird nest out of that, it burns with this metal match or the ferrocerium rock. It works really good. So that's your fire. Got to know fire skills, right? It prevents hypothermia, and that's what I was talking about. I need a fire to warm up so I don't get hypothermia. Okay, don't get too cold so I can keep going. I might be out of water. I need some water. I have to go down the river or the creek to get my water. I'm not going to drink it as it is. That's poison. So I'm sure to get sick. So I'm going to have my container that's also in my kit. And I'm going to boil it in my container. So fire enables me to do all those things. It'll keep me warm. It can clean my water. And it can boost my morale, knowing that I got fire, I warmed up and feel good. Now if I go, you know, maybe I have a candy burger or something in my car. This went through the grocery. I'm good. I'll be fine. So you got your fire skills. Next, you got to have shelter. got to have shelter. That's the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles, festival shelter. Build a shelter. You go out, you build a shelter, and you dwell in it. So if you're doing that festival, you should have an idea of how to build a shelter. Right? Now, I love building those shelters. We love doing that. Um, and we do it different every year. You know, we did it the more traditional Jewish way the first year or two. We had the three walls and the fabric and it was all fancy. It looked really nice. And then I started exploring more. You know, Jonah, when he went to Nineveh, God built a sukkah over him. Did you know that? He built a sukkah over him to protect him from the wind and the rain. So that gave me no idea. You know, this traditional Jewish thing they say doesn't protect you from the wind and the rain, but it's the same thing. So I was like, we need something a little more substantial. So we built what I call the Jonah sukkah, the debris hut. Okay? And um, that was really nice. You know, you're protected from wind and rain, you're more insulated. Uh, you get a little dirtier, but it's fun. You know, you know what you're out there doing. But in the context of what we're talking, there's another way. 
Again, referring back to our kit, you have your cup, which is what you make your shelter with. And what that is, is basically, they call it an emergency blanket or a survival blanket. They're made out of mylar and they have a coating of plastic on both sides of them. And they're usually about five foot by seven foot and they have bronze in the corners. And this is what it looks like. Something like that. Pretty simple. Now these things will reflect back 90% of your body heat back down on top of you. So, what you need to do is learn how to make a shelter with this thing. Again, you want to do it within five minutes. Remember, fire within five minutes, shelter within five minutes. The reason is, how long do you know what's called the rule of threes? Now this is speaking in generalities. Okay, You can go three minutes without air. You can go three days without water. You can only go three hours without shelter. So if you're sitting out weather like today for three hours and you're wet and cold, that would be very true. So you want to be able to get this up as quick as possible and start reforming your body. So what you would do is you would basically make a lean-to shelter. You would pin this up, pin up the other side and stake out the back too. Or you can just put one corner up and stake it out and make what's called a plow. So this is kind of looking like that a little bit more. And uh, then from one step away from the shelter, that's where you're going to build your fire. That way that fire radiates within this thing and reflects that heat back down on your body. That air will be nice and toasty, right? You still don't want to be on the ground if you're out there. You're going to put something that's going to be on the ground. So if you cut some leaves or twigs, you might not find leaves now, obviously, but um, cedar trees, any kind of green material, pine trees, or anything like that, you want to sit that sit, sit on that stuff. If you can find old plastic or tarps or garbage bags or anything, so between you and the ground, that's what you want to do. That's going to keep you warmer and make things go a little bit easier. So you got fire and shelter. What do you think's next on the list? What's your next weapon? First stone is fire. Second stone is shelter. Got to drink something, right? Got to have some water. So you got to know how to clean water. The quickest, easiest way is boiling. If you can boil water, you will always have clean water. Which brings us to the next piece of the kit, the container. You always carry a container. Now this container I have in here is illustrative. It's not the actual one I would say to get. You want a stainless steel container. You want it in a bottle shape. Okay, because that's important as well. And we'll get to that in a few more minutes. If you want a stainless steel container, you can buy these at Walgreens for five bucks usually. Um, you want a wide mouth if you can find it. There's a company called Clean Canteen that makes them. You want it about 32, 36 ounces. If you get much bigger than that, it's kind of overkill. But and you want to make sure, most importantly, it does not have seams. Like this one here, you can see a seam all the way around it. If you get this hot repeatedly, I'll pop off. No, I can't do it. You want to get one solid piece. So you've got to have a container. If you have that container, you can always boil water. Now, if you're in a situation to where maybe somebody's following you, maybe somebody's chasing you, you don't want to be seen, you don't want to make a fire, don't know. Might be in that situation. Well, you're going to want to have catalysts. A tincture of iodine or some type of water purification tablet. And you want to add that to your kit. That way, if you've got a 32 ounce container and you put in the required tablets, all tablets are measured out for 32 ounces. So if you've got a 32 ounce container, you know exactly how much water you need. Throw your tablets in, screw it on them, you're good to go. The one day you need tablets, you forgot. Now what do you do? Well, you got to have an alternative. If it's the middle of summer and you can find water, but you don't have tablets and you can't boil it because you're on the run, 
That's why you keep it in a dry bag like this, preferably a clear one. You fill this up with water and throw it in your back, on your back in direct sunlight, and the sun will distill this water in here and it will purify your water through UV radiation. So that's just one way extra of cleaning your water. You can do the same thing if you find a two liter bottle or a glass bottle or something like that. It's clear, perfectly clear. Uh, it'll do the same thing. So that's your water. You gotta have your water. The next thing, we got fire, shelter, water. Now we need what? Everybody thinks food. Security. Security next. Because Jesus went 40 days without eating. We know there's people that have gone longer than that without eating. So, I don't know, I can go without eating for 40 days. So, I won't like it, but I can do it. So, that's last. We want security. Security leads to sustainability. So, you think of security. What type of security measure do you have? You got your knife, right? You want a knife fight? No, you don't want to do that. That's, that's a good. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So, a lot of people think, well, I have a whip. That's security. That's not security in the sense that we mean it. Remember, those who live by the sword, die by the sword. Security means we tie. Okay? We have something to protect ourselves, but also the ability to conceal ourselves. That gives us security. So, if we're out there in the woods in a survival situation, um, maybe somebody's after us. Maybe we're just trying to get home after a catastrophic event in the city. Maybe we're trying to get to grandma's house. Whatever. Okay? Throw out your own scenario. You want to be able to go from point A to B within two to three days. Now, on foot, you might not be able to use a car, you may not have a horse. So, A to B within three days, and you want to be able to do it covert. In the midst of that, you want to be able to protect yourself. In my area, we have black bear, we have wild hogs that get 350 pounds, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them. There's coyotes, there's bobcats, there's all the stuff you find in Kentucky, right? Well, um, I don't want to go and lay down under one of these flimsy little shelters tonight. I might be warm. But every time a noise cracks outside, I'm jumping up and I'm not getting any rest, right? And normally, think of the guys on the front here, back in the old days. Everybody thinks they'd go down, go to bed, and eight hours later they got up. No, they'd sleep 20, 30 minutes at a time because they were freezing. They were wearing wet buckskin clothes. You know, that's just how it was. It was horrible staying outside. It was not nice. There was nothing great about it. It was very hard, and they were very tough people. All of them were hard and tough. We are not. We are used to air conditioning, heat, and simple things, right? Most of us, if we're thrust into that situation, are going to die if we are not prepared. And we'll die in three days. Look at, it was just on the news before I left. Somebody went off the road and was out there for two days and was dehydrated. They were already starving and they were getting ready to die. And somebody just happened to find them. And I think, I don't know if it was in Kentucky or Indiana, but it was on the news, so it could have been even more. Right before I left. And we're in decent weather. It's not that bad out right now. But it just shows you could have anybody. So, you need to have security. So, beyond that, we have things that would help give us security and lead us into sustainability. Security, like I said, something to give you a little more protection. If that means covering your shelter up a little more, maybe you're going to pile a bunch of trees or leaves up around your shelter and camouflage it. And, you know, just keep little critters from coming and messing with your face while you're sleeping. That's going to make you feel safer, right? And that's what you want. You want to feel safe. Maybe you do have a firearm with you. You got a little bit more security, and that's okay. But if you got a fire, you got your shelter, you know how to clean water, that, that's going to give you some security and peace of mind right there. You know right in the bend, I'm not going to die. I'm secure. The more secure you feel or the more comfortable you are where you're at, the longer you can be that way. That is sustainability. 
And that's where we want to be. We don't want to be surviving. Because if you're surviving, that means death is knocking at the door all the time. If you make one wrong move, you can die. We don't want to be there. We want to be self-reliant. Meaning, we can go out there and just be okay. We can live outside. And it's not a big deal. So it's going to take some basic skills to get us there. right? So we'll explore the rest of this kit and see where it comes into play. We know that Everything in here is multi-purpose. We have our cutting tool. That's self-explanatory. We can do all kinds of neat stuff with the cutting tool. We have our metal mat, our fire combustion device. That's going to give us fire. Now, one of these things lasts 20 to 30,000 strikes. Just one of these. That's a lot of fires. You're not going to make that many fires. So, that's going to last you. Don't got to worry about it. And if you get a good brain, it's not going to break. You have your cover. If you get a good quality, I've had this one here for a year and I've abused it, but that's a poor quality. If you get a better quality one, you'll get years of use out of it. You gotta practice, remember? You gotta practice everything you do. You got your container, that's multi-use. That'll keep you, the cover's gonna keep you warm, you can cover up with it. You can use the reflective side of the signal for rescue if you need it to. But you can also use it as a shelter to heat your body back up. Your container is going to clean your water. It's going to carry your water. If you want to make soup while you're out there, maybe you can make some kind of a stew you can cook in. Okay? Um, what else can you do with it? Make soap in it. I've made soap in mine. It's nasty to get the taste back out of it. <laughs> it takes me a while to get it out. But if you have fat and you have some ash, you can make bush soap. Just put it in your canteen or whatever container you have. Take some pine needles and cut it up and add some, you know, aromatics to it and vitamin C and things like that. And let it harden. You got soap. Now you can stay clean on top of everything. That's nice. Then we check out the rest of the kit. So again, there's our extra knife. Nothing special about it, just a fixed blade. We have a multi-tool. Multi-tool can be the pliers with all the neat gadgets on them. That's a good multi-tool to have, but it can also mean a saw. And this is just one of them simple folding saws. Now remember, you get what you pay for, right? With all your equipment, just simple folding saw, a lot of pruning saw, okay? Um, you want one of these in there. If it's winter time, you want to have another kit to where you have an axe. Because right now, if I want to use this on these frozen tree limbs, it's not going to do me a lot of good. I'll probably break the saw. So there's another thing you want. You want a bandana. You want a full size, at least one. The more you have, the better. If you want four or five, get four or five. This is a multi-use item, right? One thing, you get hot like I am, you can dab yourself, right? You can make, you know, you can put it on your head and keep it cool in the summertime, right? You can get it wet, put it around your neck. You can use it is a water filter over your container to remove turbidium. Turbidium is little bits and pieces. They're in water. So if you go down to a creek or water, you know how it's always got a little spill, a little something in there. You just throw this over top of your container, just like that, and point the container away from the stream, and it'll backfill through your filter. Now you got filtered water. It still has to be boiled. Okay? So that'll get the bits and pieces and jump out. The most important thing you use this for is charcoal. Surefire method. You put it in your container, okay? Stuff the whole thing down in your container. If you want to tear it up into strips or little squares like that big, that's a good way to go. Stuff it all down in your container. Don't put the lid on your container because plastic's no metal. So you're going to want to rock on top of your container. If you buy the right type of container, it'll have a, a nesting cup. The container will fit down in the cup that fits it nicely. You take the cup and put it on top. You put it in the fire and let it burn. Now what it's going to do, it's going to char your material till it's jet black. You'll see flames coming out from under the container and everything. And when it stops, when it stops smoking, when you stop seeing flames, you remove it and let it cool completely down. You take it off too fast, it'll burst into flames. 
You leave it on, set it to the side, let it completely cool. When you're done, you'll have black pieces of cloth. And you know, all you got to do is take this metal match or anything that will give you a spark. Flint and steel, anything. One little flip and you got fire. It's that quick and easy. One of the best things you can do is have a bandana. You want 100 foot of cordage. This is called bank line. You can use it for catfish. I call it, I guess, truck line maybe. I don't know. Um, just bank line, fishing line. Okay, it's thick. This is the number 36. Paracord. You know, get 100 foot of paracord. Um, you want 100 foot because you can remove the inner strands of paracord. Now you got seven inner strands. Now you got seven inner foot of cord that you need. You're going to use your cordage to put your shelter up. You might even make a spear, so you're going to tie your knife to your to a stick, and now you've got a security device. You might, might see a wild pig, and you need to help it or something. Don't get away from it. Whatever. Um, you want 100 foot of cordage. You can make traps, snares, all sorts of things with your cordage. Do equipment repair. You want a compass. Now this is a cheap Walmart compass. I don't recommend one of these. You want an orienteering style compass though. Because if you can get it, get a topographical map of your area or your region, or the place you plan on going to, and know how to get there using a map and compass. Okay? You want to be able to know how to use an orienteer with your compass. At least, if nothing else, be able to read a bearing or an azimuth. You know the number and then you can follow it and get from A to B. If you know that, you're going to be okay. But you want an orienteering style, I'll show you another one here in a minute, which is better. If you want a candling device, for that purpose, it's a headlamp. And you've probably seen headlamps. Not a flashlight, headlamp. Something you wear on your head, right? So you just put it over your head or put it over your hat. That's what you want. The reason you want a headlamp is because it keeps your hands free. Say you have to move around at night time, you definitely don't want to be carrying a bunch of stuff in your hands. So, um, self-explanatory. Leave you free to work so you can put it on your head. Gorilla tape. Not duct tape, gorilla tape. Duct tape doesn't burn like Gorilla Tape. And that's why you want Gorilla Tape. It's reusable. If you use it, you can peel it off, put it on your shirt, and keep on walking, and you can reuse that same piece repeatedly. So the adhesive they put on this is good stuff. So you want Gorilla Tape. Um, two inch wide, which is what this one is, spend 11 bucks and get the big roll. You can make a canteen with Gorilla Tape. I've done it. It works. You can get a leak-proof canteen. If you need serious equipment repair, say you tore a big hole in your shelter or your blanket, this is going to fix it and it's going to keep it watertight so you don't have to worry about it anymore. No you want gorilla tape. <coughs> yes, gorilla tape, you can send me a free box. So, another fire starting device. Most people have seen these before magnesium bar with a little bit of a ferro rod here. If you like these and you're used to them, that's fine. I hate these myself. I won't use them. I throw it in here as something extra. Okay? If that's where you're at and you can get it and you like it, by all means, use it and get used to using it. This is difficult to use in comparison to the one I carry. It's just a little more difficult. So, that makes up the 10 piece kit. Everything fits in your watertight bag, now you're done with it. You don't gotta worry about it, right? So, that gives you all the way up to security and sustainability. The more comfortable you are with using that stuff, the longer you're gonna be able to stay outside. That makes sense? Now we gotta worry about food, that's our fifth stone, right? So, we got food. What are we gonna eat? And how are we gonna get it? You need to know how to use just the tools you have to get your food. One, if you're going three days, just fast. Go without. 
you don't need it. But if somebody's chasing you and you're running, or in some high calorie, high octane situation, you're going to burn your calories faster. You may have a medical problem. Uh, you're diabetic and you have to eat. You've got to plan ahead. Have that stuff built into your kit. Snack bars, candy bars, high calorie rations, uh, mainstay rations are like 24, 30, 600 calories in a bar or something. You throw a couple of them in your kit. Now it's no worries. You can go seven to ten days and not worry about it. So you want to plan ahead. Um, know how to make traps and snares with the cordage you have in your kit. Now, are you going to sit there and plan on trapping deer and all that kind of stuff? No, you're, you could, but it's very unlikely. You know, if you're out there trapping in a survival situation, you want small game animals. Fish if you can get it. Fish is a number one. You can fish and it's easy to fish and you can dam them up if you find them in the right place. But if you're just out in the middle of nowhere woods and you're planning on surviving and eating wild edibles and all that, guess what? There aren't no wild edibles right now. You need to know trees before you know wild edibles. Because trees can provide you something all year round. You can eat tree bark. You know, you can fry up certain types of bark and it'll taste like a potato chip. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. What trees will give you water in the middle of winter? Sycamore. If you go cut open a sycamore and start sucking on it, it'll give you some sap and a little bit of water. Um, this cold, cold weather, you know, it's going to take a lot of sucking on that tree to get something out of it. But in general, you're going to have to get a work, okay? Um, there's water vines. You know, you go and you see them big, thick vines in the woods sometimes, you cut those. And sometimes they'll give you water. So you got to know that kind of stuff more so than what plants are good to eat. So that's going to help you uh, along the way. Um, grass. You can eat grass. Everything else does. There's 400 kinds of grass. You can eat all of them, but you can't swallow them. Because the fiber is so thick in the grass it'll shut your system down. You can't digest it. So you can chew on the grass, any grass, and swallow the juices, which will give you the nutrient value from the grass, but you got to spit the pulp out. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, do you want brown grass that's outside right now? No, no nutrient value, not much in there. So I eat snow before I do that, but that does what? Lowers your core body temperature, so that's out too. So you got to think in those type of things, you know, what's better? You know, a lot of people think, well, if I just start eating snow, I'm going to lower my thirst. You know, or that'll help rehydrate. No, there's 85, 90% uh, air in snow. You're getting very little water value. And that's why if you put, fill your canteen full of snow, you're only going to get that much water out of it. So it's better to get a chunk of ice. You know, and throw that ice and break up some ice, put it in your canteen, put it close to your body and let that melt, because then it's only it's the reverse. You only got maybe five or ten percent air value, and the rest is all water. So you want to think in those type of terms. Um, knowing how to boil that or melt it down comes back to your fire skill. So each skill plays off the other. So that's why it's important to round out all five skills. All five stones. Remember, a jacket stone doesn't fly very far and doesn't, won't hit its target effectively. So you need to practice and round out every skill area to make sure that it can go far and go longer, further than anything else you got. Does that make sense? So, it comes down to practice, practice, practice. That way it's rare. And then when you're faced with that situation, like David was with life. He had all five skills. He had all five stones in a shot bag. But it only took one to overcome the survival situation. Be the same way with us. We don't know which one it's going to take. It could be the fire skill that saved our life. That's the skill that we were able to use to signal for rescue. We were able to make the fire real fast because the airplane was passing over. So we were way far out. But we needed to attract attention from somebody far away. We made a fire, and boom, we made three separate signal fires. 
big giant fires, 100 foot apart. And they know that's a signal for rescue. They started coming our way. That's the skill. That was the stone that saved our life that day. Maybe it was a shelter. Maybe the, the weather turned against us. It got real cold. The wind started blowing. The storm front came in. And boy, if we didn't know how to make a shelter fast, we could have died. So maybe it's the shelter that got us to it. Or maybe we stayed out longer than we planned because we were being chased or trying to outrun or hide from somebody. And we ended up staying out longer. We ran out of our medicine. Or we just burnt through calories faster than we thought. And we had to eat something. And because we know a couple wild edibles or a couple trees that we could eat, or I got lucky and I caught a, a squirrel or a rat or whatever, you know, hey, if you're about to die, guess what? I bet you're going to eat. So maybe that's the thing that saved your life. We just don't know. And you know, I know some of us here, we, we don't even want to eat those things. And that's okay. That's between you and God. But we have never been pushed to that. And we won't know what we're going to do until we're pushed to that point. We can say all kinds of neat things to make us sound holy. But when we're there in the time, God's either going to give us something else, you know, He's going to send that nice and Hebrew National Hot Dog down, or whatever. Okay? We're going to have to come to that point. We're not going to know to do that. So everything else we say, I can suggestion. You know, we got to have the skill just in case we need it. God forbid we ever do it. We don't want to get to that point. So we've seen this 10 piece kit. We know that if you got this kit, it's going to help you tremendously. Just these 10 items, that's really all you need. For three to five days in area. You don't need anything else. You don't need the pocket stove and the big backpacks and all the neat gadgets they try to sell you. You really don't. You need fifty, sixty dollars worth of stuff when you do it. Now, I have this thing. This is for the pros. <laughs> this is just this is something else that you can do. This is a, we don't know what this is called yet. We, I call it a doomsday vest. That's what we're calling it for now. So it's basically a vest. It has all the same stuff in it that the kid does. So I don't want the world proof thing. Y'all want to carry a cool looking vest on. Okay? So it just leaves your hands free. You can run and you can be on the go and work from it. That's what's cool about it. Uh, one, it's got a water bottle. It's got pockets for everything. So I'll open this up. It's open. There's my water bottle right there. So that's in there. In this side, we have more room to carry. I have a water filter. Now this little water filter here. Each little disc, you see those little discs in there? Little discs, 50 gallons of water. Each little disc. So that's 250 gallons of water that I can do with all the little discs in this little thing. And all I have to do is put the filter on, put the straw on, bend over and start drinking out of whatever set pool I find. And it's clean. It'll kill and clean that water and I don't got to worry about it. So this is great. The little bag, the way it, this is made, is, is made to hold the extra water. So I have a drinking bag, like a little cup. So I want to do that. Another cool thing about this filter, it connects to any bottle. So if you have a two liter and you want to clean enough water to fill up the two liters with this, it'll filter all the water into a two liter and then you just screw on the cap and squirt the bottle and you've got a squirt bottle and it'll filter all the way through. So it'll fit on the standard 20 ounce cold bottle. So if you find anything like that out in the woods, you're going to find that out in the woods nowadays, right? You got one of these, you're good to go. This is 20 bucks. Called Frontier Pro. I would recommend everybody get it. Good this kind of thing. Then I have my cordage. I have my headlamp. And then I have my surefire. And all it is is take an empty pill bottle and I fill it with cotton balls and vaccine mixed up. I can get 20 of them in the pill bottle like that. That's 25. So, all that's just in the pocket. And I 
time order and have to put more stuff in the Now, on this side, I have a compass. This is the kind of compass you want. The reason is, it has a mirror. Okay? And you want one like this because, one, you can signal with it. You can catch sunlight on it and do a little signaling. Or if you got a buddy that's on ahead of you, you're all trying to be quiet and covert about something, you flash back and forth. You have to figure out your own code. Not everybody knows the most code in you, but you can lose your flashes and do this, okay? Um, also, it has a sighting uh, notch up here at the top. So you pick your point by looking at the site and then you read the bearing off the mirror. This makes life easier, especially at nighttime, because if you're trying to look and look up and keep doing that all night long and you're trying to move at night, it's a nightmare. But if you have a headlamp, you can see everything all at one time, it makes life easier. So you want something like this. These are 25, 30 bucks. Everything costs something. You know what I mean with this stuff. But if you buy it once and you buy it quality, you don't gotta buy it anymore. So that's why I don't recommend going to Walmart and getting everything you can. If you want that for a car kit, just to throw in your car like this, is made mainly Walmart stuff. You know, I spent 30, 40 bucks and throw in your car and leave it there. Just forget it. That way you know you got it if you ever had to have it. I'll save that for last, that's my special pocket. Uh, this pocket has shark ball, remember, a fabric. This has another cutting tool. Now this cutting tool is cool because you always want more than one cutting tool. You can get two, three, you're good, all right? So this one has a whistle built in. Then it also has the fire seal, that thing I carried on my other knife, built into it as well. You just scrape it on the nice clothes you get. And then I also have a complete fire kit in the outboard tin. Outboard tin like this is cool because again you can signal with it, so it catch light and you get a reflect. But in here I have a lighter, a Fresnelin magnifier, a thing out of an MRE that'll keep food, that's surefire. I have like I said, flint steel, I have juke twine, I have charcoal, and I have matches. I'm gonna have a fire. So that's what you want. All that goes up here. And if you can find one of these vests, that's any way to go. This, nothing but cordage and shelter material. There's so much you can fit in this vest, it's, it's crazy. Right here I have another roll of little duct tape, one of these rolls of roller tape. So I got more fire stuff. I have a knife sharpener. I have a multi-tool. Not that so all that's just in these pockets. So I have my 10-piece kit plus more just in the pockets. And it's very comfortable to wear this. Then I open up this pocket and I have an electric. You pull out your electric and you got your little gun. And that goes right here. We're going to use gun for Those live by the sword, out of the sword. Right? Better be a defensive situation or hunting. Right? That's what you want it for. So I have it. It's got my holster, I got ammo, and I got a magazine pouch right here. Plenty of space for all that stuff. This type of vest has hand warmers behind your big pockets. So behind your big ones, you get to put your hand warmers in, you take it off. Then you get into the back. You got a water bladder, put your water bladder. You got your rescue signal right here. And you got your backpack. And this whole thing here extends out and makes a full size backpack as well. So it'll go flat or not. You put your shelter material, and in here I actually have a tent. So if you want a tent, instead, you got a tent. So this is just another carry option for your 10 piece kit. So that's it. You got two complete kits there. And as long as you got that material, you're good. And you'll be able to survive 
three days, four days, five days, seven days, and you're good. Make sense? So, how does that again relate to what David did? He had faith and he had the experience, right? You gotta get the experience with the tools you have. If you don't have experience with it, you can have it and you can say, well, I got the kit, I'm good. But you never went out and learned how to use everything. You never went out and practiced with it. You're out of luck. So when you need it, you don't have it. So you gotta take the steps. Get the experience. You got the faith. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have faith, right? So you got the faith already. You know what God's taking you or where God's wanting you to go. Maybe you're just not ready to get there yet. Or you're kind of dragging your feet. Saying, well, I don't know enough. Don't want it. Don't like it. I'm too old. I'm too young. Whatever case you know, we got. The Lord's going to just wrap me out here before anything bad happens. You know, um, well, when it gets bad, the Lord is going to rapture me out. Guess what? Before, if you believe that, fine. But before it happens, it's still going to be bad. Even before, it's still going to be bad. And it's going to be difficult. What if there's an ice storm next week and you're stuck at home without electricity? Have you prepared? Do you have enough food at home the last week? Maybe, maybe not. That's another consideration you need to think about. If all these doom and gloom scenarios, if any one happened, we're all in trouble. You gotta prepare. You gotta have the experience to back the faith up. Experience extends to home. You gotta have all this stuff at home. You gotta have the equipment and the extra gear, the prepper stuff, all your food and all your other stuff at home, built up, ready to go. So that maybe it's not for you. Maybe something happens, you're one of the martyrs. You know, you go out, you're, they knock on your door first and they take you and put you on some train going somewhere back. Maybe that's you. That's okay. Because the Bible says, in that time, He'll give you the words to speak to your accusers, right? That's okay. That's your place. Go willingly and say, well, guess what? I know where I'm going. Here's my job. And I, you tell them how it is. Because the Lord's going to give you the words to speak. And when that happens, whoever comes along your stash is going to be blessed. Maybe you've got books. Maybe you've left them notes. Things like that. Think of every little detail in all this prepping, survival, and all this stuff is opportunity for ministry. You're just bringing more people in. Bringing them closer to God. That's your goal with every bit of it. So, you know, when I got into it, that's what it was about. You know, it wasn't because I want to survive. I don't care. You know, I know where I'm going. If I die tomorrow, hey, just as good. But you got to know that's not my call. That's not your call. You know, not yet. We know that there are things that have to be done. And it takes somebody to do some of these things, right? We all got to take our steps out, do our little parts, because all together we make a whole. And then we'll start seeing things get done. So for me, it was all about preparing people not just to get through it, but to help others get through it. And to bring more into the kingdom in the process. Because when things come and get bad, that's when the glory is going to shine forth the brightest. So when they come and they see us, they're going to be like, oh, dog, we got to go hang with these people. Because they know what's going on. Look, they're ready. How do they know to be ready for all this stuff? We are going to be a filling station. You know, when people come and they're hopeless and you know don't know what to do and they're lost, guess what? I got some answers. You know, I, I'm going to have stuff there to help them. And either they're going to stay or they're going to go on their way. Doesn't matter to me. I'm going to equip them and sharpen them the best of my ability and send them on to the next person. Each one sows seed, one got waters, another got harvest. I'll do my part, whatever it might be. And that's the way we got to look at all this kind of stuff. It's not doom and gloom. It's opportunity and excitement. Because one, we know who's coming. We know the King is coming back. Why are we so sad? Why are we worried? You know, they might take our gun. They might take our ammo. Who cares? It's all for a purpose. He's coming back. It's supposed to happen. Let's get excited about it. It says, 
I got to stock up. Everybody's the zombies are coming. I call zombies. <laughs> I call zombies people that you know go to church every week and don't do anything with book though. They're walking dead. They don't even know. Think about it. They're walking dead. They're the zombies that go in. <laughs> they go and they sit and they pay their tax and they're done. They've done their duty. There's no intimacy with the Father. They don't know who He is. They don't obey His teaching. You know, they're zombies. They're walking dead. What's going to happen to them? Are they the ones crying, Lord, didn't I do all these things in Your name? He says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. Lawlessness. He didn't do what I told you to do in the first place. Maybe those are the zombies. Maybe there is a zombie apocalypse. So we need to think of these things and uh, keep it in mind. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you all for letting me talk and ramble. Question this.